Basically, the theory is we're all born thinking like entrepreneurs. You know, like when we crawl and we start and we fall, uh, you know, when we're trying to walk, we figure it out. Entrepreneurs always figure out, you're born thinking like an entrepreneur that, you know what, I'm gonna figure this out regardless and I'm gonna keep going. Now, often the challenge is families and friends convince you not to be an entrepreneur because when you say I'm gonna change the world, I'm gonna be the most famous person, I'm gonna save the seals, they say don't do that. You, it, it didn't happen before. Yeah. You, it's never happened. You're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna fail. You're gonna embarrass us. They put the limiters on it. They put the limiters on yeah. They put the blinders on you, but true entrepreneurs will just keep figuring it out. People say you, you have to have a lot of passion for what you're doing, and it's totally true, and the reason is, uh, is because it's so hard that if you don't, any rational person would give up. It's really hard, and you have to do it over a sustained period of time. So if you don't love it, if you're not having fun doing it, you don't really love it, uh, you're gonna give up. So just go and do it, try, learn from it. You, you know, you'll fail at some things, but that's a learning experience that you need so that you can take that on to the next experience. Um, and don't let people who you may respect uh, and who you believe know what they're talking about, don't let them tell you it can't be done. Because often they will tell you it can't be done, and uh, it's just because they don't have the courage to try it. I think people that look for great ideas to make money uh, you know, aren't nearly as, as successful as those who say, okay, what do I really love to do? What am I excited about? What do I know something about? You know, what's kind of interesting and compelling? It's uh, very rewarding when you work on something you think is going to make a big difference. And uh, yeah, it's a little bit harder, but I think, uh, I think the passion that one might bring with it uh, brings so much more energy to that that you're more likely to succeed. You have to have an emotional investment in what you're doing. If you don't love what you're doing, um, failure is pretty much guaranteed. Success is not guaranteed by any means, but failure is m much more likely if you don't love what you're doing. If you know exactly what you wanna be, you need to spend as much time with people that are actually that already. You know, one of the things that I do is I question a lot of things. Um, and you can do that in a good way and in a bad way, but hopefully if you try to get people to motivate why they're doing something and their way of thinking, you know, the worst thing you can end up with is a situation where um, you get told, well, this is the way it's always been. That's the worst ever. That's a non-answer. Instead, ask yourself, you know, given everything we have today, is there a way we can make this better? Do something you're very passionate about. And don't try to chase what is kind of the hot passion of the day. I have an old-fashioned belief that I can only should expect to make money in things that I understand. And when I say understand, I don't mean understand, you know, what the product does or anything like that. I mean understand what the economics of the business are likely to look at, look like 10 years from now or 20 years from now. I know in general what the economics of, say, Wrigley chewing gum will look like 10 years from now. The internet isn't going to change the way people chew gum. It isn't going to change which gum they chew. You know, if you own the chewing gum market in a big way, and you've got double mint and spearmint and juicy fruit, those brands will be there 10 years from now. So I can't pinpoint exactly what the numbers are going to look like on Wrigley, but I'm not going to be way off if I try to look forward on something like that. That evaluating that company is within what I call my circle of competence. I understand what they do. I understand the economics of it. I understand the competitive aspects of the business. So. Figuring out the economic consequences. TV, I think there's, I don't know, 20, 25 million sets a year sold in the United States. I don't think there's one of them made in the United States anymore. I mean, you'd say TV set manufacturer, what a wonderful business. I mean, everybody, now nobody had a TV in 1950, they're about 45 to 50. Everybody has multiple sets now, but nobody is in the United States has made any real money making the sense that they're all out of business. You know, the Magnavoxes, the RCAs, all of those companies. Radio was the equivalent of the 20, over 500 companies making radios in the 1920s. Again, I don't think there's a, a U.S. radio manufacturer at the present time. But Coca-Cola, you know, 
was it, 1884, at Jacob's Pharmacy or whatever, and the fellow comes up with something. A lot of co copiers over the years. But now you've got a company that is selling roughly 1.1 billion eight-ounce servings of its product, not all Cokes, Bright, and some others, daily throughout the world 117 years later. So understanding the economic characteristics of a business is different than predicting the fact that an industry is going to do wonderfully. And so when I look at the internet businesses or I look at tech businesses, I say this is a marvelous thing and I love to play around on the computer and it, now I order my books from Amazon and all kinds of things, but I don't know who's going to win. And unless I know who's going to win, I'm not interested in investing. I'll just play around on the computer. And uh, uh, <laughs> Defining your circle of competence is the most important aspect of investing. It's not how important, uh, how, how large your circle is. You don't have to be an expert on everything. But knowing where the perimeter of that circle of what you know and what you don't know is and staying inside of it is all important. Tom Watson Sr., who started IBM, said in his book, he said, I'm no genius, he said, but I'm smart in spots and I stay around those spots. And, and you know, that is the key. Uh, so if I understand a few things and I stick in that arena, I'll do okay. And if I don't understand something, but I get all excited about it because my neighbors are talking about it, the stocks are going up and everything, they start fooling around someplace else, eventually I'll get cream, and I should just do my work. For me, I've always been very utilitarian on all of this stuff. And that's what coming from punk rock gave to me, where I don't feel like I'm anybody. And someone wants me to sign something, I'm like, sure. I don't exactly understand why, but I'll do it for you. I don't think I'm anything. Maybe it's also not just because of the punk rock mentality, it's also because you were scooping ice cream not so long ago. And maybe there's an element of insecurity in you that unless you keep working and keep, keep striving, you could end up back there. Oh, I kind of figure that's eventual. I keep moving forward boldly because I have nothing to lose. I, I'm nobody from nowhere. You should really understand that. I am from the minimum wage working world 100 years ago. But I, I don't ever have it in my head that that's any less, any more than one tour away than hmm. of coming back. And so I just, re I like to work. It's not about money or fame or anything. It's about activity and challenge. And so when we're coming up with ideas you know, we always ask ourselves, um, what kind of new market is this creating? And then also, what what part of my day and, and what problem is it solving? And so I've gone as far as taking an entire catalog of my day from the moment I like open my eyes and writing down every single thing I do. And then asking myself, like, is there something here? And you know what everybody wants to hear? What they already believe to be true. And so the last thing they want to hear is an original idea that contradicts their belief system. So it's very hard to even bring that kind of stuff up. But those are the things, those are the only things, things that you believe that everybody around you doesn't believe when you're right that create real value in the world. Everything else people already know. There's no value created. It's just business as usual. So it's so important to think for yourself. It's so hard. I thought doing this research, I thought going into it, there were authentic people and inauthentic people. Mm -hmm. I had, I did not find any evidence of that at all. What I found is authenticity is a practice and you choose it every day, sometimes every hour of every day. And it's a practice. It's not, I just wake up and hey, I'm authentic. It's that when you walk into a meeting, you have to make the choice. Am I gonna show up and let myself be seen? Am I gonna, am I gonna raise my hand and say, Wow, y'all look super excited. I don't know what in the hell you're talking about. I'm so lost. <laughs> you know, that's a choice. Yes, uh-huh. Right? Mm -hmm. And what to, and to be, make that authentic choice, you gotta let go of... Of, 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 of the fake, fakeroo, I say. Yeah. I call it the fakeroo. But you know what? I have found, I mean, I, I consider myself to be an authentic person, but when I am inauthentic is when I've allowed myself to be around people who were not, and then I have to fake it to be with them. Oh, for sure, it's contagious. Yes, so they're faking it, yeah. and then, and you know you're in that situation when you do that, ha ha, that kind of ha ha, you're laughing at jokes that aren't funny, you're pretending to be comfortable when you're not, and lose your own authenticity. Yeah, and I do it. 
don't solicit feedback on your product, your idea, or your business just for validation purposes. Be really careful about that. You want to tell the people that can help move your idea forward, but if you're just looking to your friend, coworker, husband, wife for validation, be careful because out of love and concern, a lot of people will express some concerns and it can stop a lot of multi-million dollar ideas right in their tracks in the beginning. Because if you build something for yourself, if you build something that you love, that you think is sufficiently epic, if you make something that you love, there's probably another billion people in the world that love it as well. You need to focus on solutions, not ideas. All of us here are really creative, and we come up with loads of ideas throughout the day, and we become really excited about that. And say, like, dude, we should start a company around that. But that's when you actually go to the other side, where you talk to, uh, where you, you know, find out what someone. Um, actually a problem a problem that they have and solve that is is when uh, you know real value comes out my advice to young chefs from the age of 16 to sort of 29 30 is 14 years of a sponge you're absorbing knowledge don't take a job for the sake of money don't worry about earning 500 pound uh, a month or a year more somewhere else go and get knowledge because that becomes a bigger passport for everything the money will come once you've mastered your craft and you become incredibly talented Work for big chefs and find a different level of comfort. When things get too comfortable and you're still living with your parents and you've still got your first job and you don't want to move out because everything's too comfortable, get out. Put yourself in a strange situation in the middle of Barcelona. Put yourself in the middle of Paris. Put yourself in the middle of Belgium and see what's available. And it's amazing how much confidence it gives you. And more importantly, it's great to, to, to sort of eat and travel at the same time. Fantastic. A lot of times I'll be in a 200 mile run or something like that and I'm all jacked up. Body's broken, mind's broken, spirit's broken. I start to say, what if I can pull this off? When I first walked into the Navy SEAL recruiter's office, he looked at me and said, there's only been 35 African-Americans in 70 years make it through. You know what I said to myself? What if I can be the 36th? It's the what if I can pull off a miracle? What if? I can become someone that no one thinks I can be. And just, that, just me talking about that, I have the hair going up on my arms because it makes me just like, what if I can be that guy that people who call nigger and this and that, and now I'm speaking at Tom Ferry's event. And I think where is the opportunity? The opportunity li always lies in the place where people complain. Some people sit there complain. You think, mm, if I can solve that complaint, that's the opportunity. I would say that the lesson learned for me to anybody else out there interested in starting a business is please find something you're passionate about because it's so much work, it's so much time, it's so much effort. But if the subject matter is something that you, you genuinely love, to be involved with, it's, it's not going to be that big of a drag and it's not going to be that big, much work. It's going to be incredibly exciting and, and rewarding because to your point, you'll feel like you're living your, the life that you're meant to live. In areas of choice, you need to work on your weaknesses. For example, mm -hmm. let's say, I, let's say I am, I'm lazy. That's an area of choice. That's, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm not naturally lazy, I'm just lazy. It's mm -hmm. a choice. So I, I need to work on that because I, mm. in areas of choices, you can make vast improvement and you can make fast improvement. I've never heard this distinction, by the yeah, way. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. Hugely helpful. Oh yeah, in choices. So yeah. attitude. Let's say I have a lousy attitude. One day I wake up, I say, "This isn't mm -hmm. getting me anywhere. I gotta have a good attitude." You can go from a zero to a ten. I mean, almost, almost over. I mean, you've seen people that you just say, "My gosh," overnight they just yeah got good and happy. You know what I'm saying? Okay, that's a choice. Vast, fast growth in choices. In giftedness, DNA, wiring, your growth is very, very small mm. and it's very slow. So I think, for example, a person can maybe increase their giftedness skill set, maybe two numbers. Wow. So if I'm a if I'm a little bit above average, I'm a six. If I really work hard, I can get, become an eight. But but an eight is is powerful. 
Yeah. Eight has a huge return. So what I tell people is in, in areas of giftedness, that's where you have to work on your strengths. If, if I'm a two in something, I'm very weak in a skill. If I worked hard, I could only become a four. I'd still be below so average. The, yeah, 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 and so what I tell yeah. people is, you gotta ask yourself, is it gonna give me the return? Mm -hmm. So in the area of strengths, you gotta pour yourself into the things that you're already good at because that'll really set you apart from average. Yeah. But in areas of choices, Go for those weaknesses because you and I don't, don't you know people that are highly skilled, but they have a lousy attitude, or they're not self oh, they're not self disciplined, the attitude. and they're never going to they're never going to they're never going to get anywhere, and they're not going to get anywhere because they didn't. So, in areas of choices, work on your weaknesses, but in areas of strengths and skills, just work on your strengths. You tend to be incredibly modest in terms of. Uh, describing your talents um, and uh, you, you always seem to belittle your, your abilities to a certain extent when clearly there, there's a reason why this everything you do has been working out. Um, I, w I was reading about how you said that uh, to a certain extent that comes from your, your punk rock roots. Yep, there's no other choice. In those days there was no idea of this makes money. There's no idea of like this is my future. It was like a week at a time. We have five shows, we're gonna get to Sunday. Whew. And even those days were like fraught with turbulence. And so I never really saw a future. None of us did. And some of us, you know, didn't make it. Some of them are dead. And some of them are just kind of trying to recreate their past. And so I realized that I have to be very hardworking because I don't have kind of the ease of talent. And I come from that. And I think it, in a, way, a lot of ways it served me very well in that I, I am as kind of hardworking as I've ever been completely un, without confidence and I have none I don't I don't want any because I, I think you turn your back on the thing and that's when you get gored is when you think I got this I never think I got this I think oh man don't screw this up and I go at everything like including you and I sitting here right now I'm trying to be fully engaged and that intensity I think has served me quite well but it comes from punk rock absolutely Last boss I ever had was my boss at haagen my ice cream job. And to this day, he still comes to my shows. And whenever I see Steve, who got me my first apartment, who I was living in my car, he believed in me. Whenever I see him, I, I get all weepy. I, I, I always tell him, it's good to see you, sir. Henry, you can call me Steve. I can't do that, sir. Because <laughs> he trusted me with his money. And, and I said, let me run your store. I, I know how to do this. I can do this. He's like, well, if you screw up, you're out of here. I said, I won't screw up. And I ended up being, I ran a store. And so, um, it would, but it was anger that said, I'll be here all damn week, I'll get this whole thing right. I fired a staff and rehired a bunch of people who can really work. And uh, it's, it was out of anger. Like, I'll, I'll be back in four hours to run this $3.75 an hour job into the ground. And then I joined Black Flag. And I thought I was a hardworking person. Then you meet the guys in Black Flag who are so driven. You see Greg Ginn work 23-hour days. Like, Greg, you're still on the phone. I know. Greg, when, when did you eat? I don't know. Greg, when was the last time you showered? Uh, do we have a shower? Like, the guy, we were not going to be stopped. And I kind of go at that intensity, kind of anything I do. Like, you're a very calm, good-looking young man. Look at me. I'm a spaz sitting next to you. Like, I'm doing an interview with you. I can't help it. You're focused. I'm focused. sweating, man. And so, but I, I, I'm like this going to the airport, like 10 miles out. <laughs> and so, um, it's, but it's anger that has informed kind of my life and unflatteringly a sense of vengeance. Every damn person who said I wouldn't be anything, I'm crushing them every day. Everybody I had to endure in any band I was in, every day into a powder. Yeah. Thank you. And I wish them no ill. I just wish to shine brighter. And if it burns my body to a crisp, I'm happy to go right now. You see, the greatest motivational principle in the world the greatest motivational principle in the world is that people do what people see. And, and, and too, many, too many travel agents, too many travel agents, they're, they're like, um, or too many leaders, too many leaders are like, they're like travel agents. They're sending people where they've never been themselves. And you want to be a tour guide. You want to take people with you. 
You want to say, this is the area where I've been, this is the area where I live, this is the area where I lead, come along and, 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 and follow me. And at level number three, your leadership begins to gain credibility because now you are fleshing out for the people around you and you are modeling for them things that they want to see and you are starting to produce. If you're not coming up with 10 ideas a day, that's why I have this thing. If I'm not coming up, if I'm not filling up this page every single day, then my idea muscle will atrophy. And I started this in 2001 and I still do it every single day. Like you have to come up with ideas every single day or the idea muscle atrophies. The good news is after about six months of doing that, you're like a machine. Like people get surprised at how many ideas you could just have anywhere. The two things we really zero in on on people are, um, you know, two things. They sound simple, they end up being very difficult. Um, courage and genius. Um, courage is the one we talk about a lot because it's the one that people can learn. Um, you, know, you know, courage, courage, which is to say not giving up in the face of adversity, um, you know, just being absolutely determined to succeed, you know, is something that you can, you can like force yourself to do. It can be very painful. You can force yourself to do it. The genius part is a little bit hard to force yourself to do. Um, you know, courage without genius might not get you where you need to go, but genius without courage almost certainly won't. I was a very headstrong young person. And by 1983 or four, had started my own publishing company to publish my own books, realizing that no one else will publish me. And I was right about that. And so my first book, I saved my food money from Black Flag, little here, little there. And I saved enough to make a fold and staple book. I couldn't type, so I hand wrote out the things and I made a dummy that I could offset print, fold and staple and I sold them for $2. Mainly gave them away, but I sold enough and they blew out, 500 just went. And then I took that money to make another print run of that. And from that money, I made my first paperback. And 33 years later, that's a fully staffed company with books in translation and hardcover editions and the whole, you know, the whole nine yards. But it started with, I'm going to do my thing. I'll be City Lights Junior without the talent. And that's, I did that at the same time I was doing my first spoken word gigs. And why did I have the gumption and the audacity to start my own book company? Because I come from punk rock. I come from watching Ian MacKay invent Discord records on his mom's kitchen table. I come from folding and gluing picture sleeves together. Black Flag had their own label. Of course you do it yourself. You want to make a book? S sit down and write it. Then go to the printing place. Where's a printer? Get in the phone book and find a printer. We make records, make some books. It was, you just do it. It's like you don't even think about it, you just do it. And I'm sure that writing is just awful, but I did it. And without even hesitation, I'm making my own book companies. Stop me, I dare you. I never thought about it twice. Just because DIY, man. Like, let your voice be heard. And I think the reality uh, is just, you know, not quite so glamorous. There's sort of a, there's an ugly side to uh, being an entrepreneur. Uh, and also just more importantly, uh, what, what you're actually spending your time on is, is just a lot of hard work. Uh, Sam mentioned this, but you're basically just sitting at your desk, heads down, focused, um, answering customer, customer support emails, doing sales, figuring out hard engineering problems. Um, so it's really important that you kind of like go in with, with eyes wide open. Optimism has a place, but I think even more so for the first-time entrepreneur, it, you need to be pragmatically pessimistic. What I mean by that is you need to define all of the worst-case scenarios in terms of financial loss, time loss, etc. Look at what you will learn if that happens and accept and come to terms with that before you ever start. If you don't do that and you go straight into battling the world trying to conquer the world with rose-colored glasses on, the first time you hit a major hiccup, you're gonna become really demoralized and you will quit. If you don't love it, you won't make it through the long period of pain that is inevitable. So uh, make sure that you take care of yourself during the process, make sure that you take care of uh, your mental health, your physical health while you're doing it because it's a long road. The first thing I want you to know that success is, is not a destination, it's a journey. Think of success as a process. Let me, let me illustrate it and explain it this way. Uh, if, if you go to college, 
Uh, you work hard, and in four or five years, depending on what kind of degree you're working on, and, and in today's society, sometimes six or seven years, but, but eventually uh, you, you comes the day of graduation, and you're all excited, and your family is there, and your friends are there, and, and you're there with your classmates, and you've got your cap and your gown, and, and you know that there's going to be a time in that ceremony where you're going to walk across stage, and the president, provost, somebody's going to shake your hand, hand you a diploma, congratulate you, and, and you're going to get off the other side, they're going to have presents waiting for you and they'll be taking pictures and everybody will be shaking your hand and say congratulations today you become a success you're, you're a college graduate now now my friend you did not become a success the day that you got your diploma now what you did have happen to you in that ceremony is you got recognized for success the diploma is recognition of what you have done the previous four or five years. You see, you were a success in your freshman year when you decided to not drop out of school like some of your other classmates and decided to stick to it. And you were a success every time you studied for a test. And you were a success every time you did a project or, or did a writing assignment. You see, you're a success all through, all through school. Uh, you're a success every day. Success is a daily thing, not a destination thing. The day you got the diploma, you just got recognized for the success that you already were. Now that's very essential. Because so many times people have a, have a tendency to devalue the moment today. What they do is they greatly value the destination. And so they kind of talk about, well, when I get there, or if I arrive there, or when I do that, or when I accomplish this. And they don't understand that success is a daily thing. And I'm here to share with you that the secret of success is determined by your daily agenda. In fact, I wrote a book a few years ago called Today Matters. I'm passionate about that book because what it does is it helps you, it helps me to understand that we make decisions and then we manage decisions. And, and too often we think, I will make a decision. For example, you're saying, I'm gonna make a decision to be a coach. Or I'm gonna make a decision, to, you know what? I'm gonna make a decision to, to be a public speaker. I wanna be a communicator. Well, congratulations, congratulations, you've made a wonderful decision. Coach, speaking, good decisions. But that won't make you a successful coach. That won't make you a successful communicator. It's not the decision that makes you. You've got to make the decision by managing it, and you manage the decision on a daily basis. In other words, what you want to be tomorrow, you've got to do today. You visualize tomorrow. That gives you hope, and that's your motivation, and that's your dream. You, nothing wrong with that. You visualize tomorrow, but you value today. What's that mean? That means that what I do every day is either getting me closer to that vision, that dream, that goal, or it's really driving me farther away from it. You see, every day, we are either repairing or we're preparing. You see, if I messed up yesterday, guess what I get to do today? Fix yesterday. <laughs> In other words, if I didn't do the right thing yesterday, what I got to do today is I've got to repair. I've got to go back, make amends, backtrack, put the car in reverse, put my life in reverse. I've got to go back there. I've got to repair. Now, every day I spend repairing, I'm not spending preparing. Well, you see, we repair when we fail to manage the decisions that we've made. We prepare when we, on a daily basis, manage the decisions that we've made. So your footprints to success are really footprints of success. Because every step that is made and taken, based upon the goals that you have for your life, and you're managing those goals correctly, every step is the progressive realization of success in your life. And by the way, oh, you, you'll get the diploma, you'll get the certificate, but, but when you get that, you didn't arrive. It just is another step in preparing you to reach your potential. Each one of us should live our life as if 
We'll never learn everything we never need to learn. We'll never be able to accomplish everything we wanted to accomplish. We won't be able to experience everything we wanted to experience. We should live our life every day hungry, understanding that we are to live until we die. You see, I think success can't be summarized in a flippant degree or program or diploma or arrival. I think today, if you are learning to coach, if you are learning to speak, if you're doing the things that are essential to the decisions and you're managing those decisions well, can I say something to you? Congratulations, you are already a success. Now, guess what? Over time, it shows up. You've heard the expression. You maybe have even said it yourself. You've heard the expression, I'm sure. I've worked all my life to become an overnight success. <laughs> That's the way it works. All of a sudden, somebody recognizes you. All of a sudden, somebody congratulates you. You didn't get good at that moment. You've been good for a long time. It just showed up someday. Started playing the guitar at the age of 12. I felt a, 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 a passion for it that, uh, yeah, it was the first real passion that I, that I, that I had. And I, and I can safely say because I feel, and I felt then that the word ambition has become dirty, you know? Yeah. Because ambition somehow implies that the result, I know. <laughs> I know, I know, cry. <laughs> I'll, I'll probably be crying in about 10 minutes. So. Um, so ambition was a dirty word to me because it felt like you were working for some gain or material or some status. Or, so I literally don't remember going through puberty. Uh, uh, because I locked myself in a room at the age of 12, 12, 13, and, and just played the guitar, learned things off records, and taught myself how to play. And it was my life. Um, and it was the only solace. It was the only sanctuary. It was the only security. It was, the, it was my first love. Um, I think my biggest tip is just get started. Um, I meet a lot of young entrepreneurs who have good ideas or bad ideas or some ideas uh, and you don't want to be a person who just talks and talks and talks. You have to actually go and do something. And don't worry about uh, if it's the perfect thing or not. There is this myth of entrepreneurship that you'll have the one genius idea and suddenly everything falls into place. It doesn't work like that. It's a hard slog. There's a lot of things to do wrong, a lot of things you'll do right. Um, the sooner you get started, the sooner you'll get somewhere. You know, one of the things that I tell people when they ask me for advice about what they should do when they're wanting to start their own business uh, or take a next step in their career is to actually start small. I think a lot of people try to, um, they kind of psych themselves out or they get too overwhelmed with how big something can get, but the truth is you really just got to start small and you got to prove it before you scale it. Try to do something that you would want to do anyway, whether it's, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be very successful business because um, when you do decide to become an entrepreneur and start a business, chances are it's not going to do. It's not going to become like a multi-million dollar business. So at least do something that you love in the beginning, so that even if it fails, you'd still enjoy it. Make sure you choose. You know, when, you, when you're trying to decide whether or not an idea is good enough to pursue, or, or a particular business is something you want to you want to go forward with, make sure that it's the type of business that when you're standing in the shower, it's the thing you want to think about for the next 10 or 20 years. I feel a genuine need to communicate with an audience, and it might just be uh, the, the attention I didn't get as a kid. I, it can't come from anything good. Uh, <laughs> But what I try and do is bring the best information I can to the stage and uh, and broadcast it. So I'm, I'm, it's reportage from distant points, from uh, a fairly unique standpoint. Uh, and so basically I, I'm not keeping it all to myself, but I, I earnestly try to, it's not about entertainment. It's about communication, warning, broadcasting, emitting, and trying to leave something of myself with these, with the audience. Not it's not mere entertainment. It's not just making people laugh or not. It's uh, it's got to hurt me. It's got to 
leave lines in my face. I don't like any artistic endeavor that doesn't extol a price on the one doing it. So I don't, I'm not looking to get through these things okay. These things are actually very difficult and uh, very hard on my psyche, which makes me think I'm doing the right thing. When somebody comes and says, John, I want to be a leader, I always ask him the question, why? Why do you want to be a leader? I mean, do you want to be a leader because you want a corner office? Do you want to be a leader because you like to be in control? Do you like to want to be a leader because you love to be in the front of the pack? Do you want to be a leader because you want to have a good parking place? Why do you want to be a leader? Because leadership isn't easy. Leadership a lot of times isn't fun. Leadership a lot of times is kind of lonely. There's only one reason to be a leader, and that is to add value to people. And you and I will only add value to people if we truly value them. I have a nonprofit organization equipped that's trained almost two million leaders internationally around the world. And I kid you not, as I go to developing countries twice a year and I travel internationally and I sit down, sometimes I have the privilege of being in the offices of presidents of countries. And as I watch these developing countries, the thing that is the cardinal sin among leadership so much is that they have leaders of their countries that truly don't value the people. And if you and I don't value people, we will devalue people number two if you want to add value to people you have to make yourself more valuable you just have to get better you have to keep growing you have to keep learning you have to keep developing why very simply if you're leading the pack you've got to be able to give what you have and you can't give what you don't have and so therefore You've got to put a lot of good stuff in so that you can pass it on to others and share with them and, and add value to them. Thirdly, if you want to add value to people, you have to know and relate to what other people value. You and I have to walk slowly through the crowd. We have to listen. We have to care. You see, great leaders are first of all listeners and then they're learners and then they're leaders. They really do take their cue from the people. They understand that the key of leadership is connecting with the people that you lead. And the only way that you and I ever connect is by caring enough to listen. Number four is very important to me. When I'm speaking in the business community, I always share with them that for them, there are three ways to add value to people. But for me, there are four. And I tell them, I'll give them the three. And, in, and so I'll, I'll spend maybe an hour doing those three things I just shared with you, sp talking about how to add value to people. And inevitably, when I'm done with the three, somebody raised their hand and said, John, you said that for you there was four, but you said there's only three for us. I said, yes, it's, it's, uh, it's nothing personal, but th this is about my faith. And so I, I don't really need to share this with you because uh, I'm trying to help you and I, I, I don't want to cross boundaries with you. And inevitably, they'll say, but John, tell us what yours is. And I'll say, well, okay, you can hear mine, but don't write it down. In fact, don't listen. Because number four for me is, if I really want to add value to people, I have to do the things that God values. And printing t-shirts and selling ink pens and, you know, I mean, every, every, any, anything and everything. Yeah, and then the fact that you have a 20-year 20, 20 career of failures and then you do a pirate movie and that buys you an island is pretty, I mean, the irony of that is pretty... <laughs> Do you think about the times when things weren't so good a lot? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. But I, I, you know, there was a guy who I worked with many years ago and we were talking about success and money and all that stuff. And um, he, he told me this one thing, he said, you know, money doesn't change anybody. Money reveals them, you know. Same thing with success and... Uh, I, I, I believe that, you know, whole, wholeheartedly. I, I, I think I've been revealed. I don't think I, I haven't changed. I, I'm still exactly the guy that used to pump gas, you know. I'm still the guy that was a mechanic for a minute, you know. I'm still, exactly. I just happen to have a weird, weirder job at the moment. Like me, have to do everything three times before we get it right. Thankfully, I know that. So I know that I have to get up early and, and try it five times because the eight-year-old will be able to get past it in two times. So I have to be on my feet longer, but at least I know it. And so I just go at stuff and it served me very well And that my resume is pretty varied and uh, I have a pretty interesting life. You know, I get to do different stuff and have a bit of access because I just said, yeah, I'll try that.
I mean, why would I hold back? The last straight job I had was 1981. Head manager of a haagen in Georgetown, in Washington, D.C., on Wisconsin Avenue at the intersection of Wisconsin and O Street, making $3.75 an hour, $4 an hour, something like that, working 40 to 60 hours a week. I had a small apartment, which I shared with an old pal of mine. I had a small record collection, an ailing VW automobile, uh, and a little tiny life with my minimum wage job, which I, I liked. And I looked at my life and realized this is probably about as good as it's going to get for me. I might quit this place and go work at my friend's record store because I liked being around records and I could probably run his store very well knowing what I knew about retail at that point. And then I got a very lucky break because at that same time I was very frustrated. I said, well, this is going to be a very tough life. It's going to be a life of a lot of standing on my feet, a lot of work, taking it from other people and having very little to show for it by Friday, you know, Friday evening. And then Black Flag, the famous band who was friends of mine, they uh, played in New York. I was in Washington. I took a, a, a ride up to go see them because they weren't coming down to my town. I jumped on stage and sang with them that night a song because I had to go back down to DC and go work like some awful shift. They called me a few days later at the ice cream store and said, you know, we're looking for a singer because the rhythm guitar player wants to, uh, I'm sorry, the vocalist wants to move down to rhythm guitar. You can tell I've told the story before. And we're holding auditions. You want to crack at this? Because we saw you on stage the other night, you're pretty wild. I looked at the ice cream scoop in my hand, my chocolate bespattered apron, and my future in the world of minimum wage work. Or I could go up to New York and audition for this crazy band who was my favorite. What's the worst that's going to happen to me? I miss a day of work. Ooh, there goes 21 bucks. And I get humiliated in front of my favorite band. Yeah, humiliation and young people kind of go together. I was used to it. And so I, I took a train up there. I walked into this practice place in the East Village. I'm standing there with the band with a microphone in my hand. They said, pick the tune. And I sang every song they had, you know, improvising most of it. Two times through, we did the set. They said, okay, you have a seat. We're going to go have a band meeting, whatever that means. And they came back like 10 minutes later. I said, okay, you're in. I said, what do you mean? They said, you're the singer in Black Flag. I said, so what do I do? They go, you quit your job. You pack your gear. You meet us on the road. Here's the, here's the tour itinerary. Here's the lyrics. We'll see you soon. So fairly numb, I went back down to Washington with this passel of lyrics in my hand. Went to my boss and said, uh, I'm not exactly quitting. But here's this thing that happened. And he said, it's your shot. I said, yeah. He said, take it. 